Hi, everyone. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today for a professional mm -hmm. development workshops, innovation in healthcare, lessons learned, and are things really changing? The Duluth Chamber is very proud to provide this offering free of charge to our chamber members because of the generosity of our sponsor, the College of St. Scholastica, Stender School of Leadership, Business, and Professional Studies. So before I go ahead and introduce our speaker, I'd like to invite Rick Ravor, who's already up here, <laughs> to say a few words on behalf of the College of St. Scholastica sponsorship. So hi, Rick. Yep. Thanks, Chris. Um, and thanks for everyone joining us. My name is Rick Ravor from the College of St. Scholastica. I'd like to thank the Chamber team for offering this series, and the Stender School is delighted to sponsor it. Just want to give a quick update on the college. In January, uh, today's presenter, Dr. Sue McLaren, launched our brand new Master's in Healthcare Administration degree. And uh, we are enrolling students in that program, as well as in our MBA in Leadership and Change program. Uh, program. If you have any questions, uh, please uh, let me or Sue know. And finally, thanks to Dr. Sue McLaren and for presenting today. Thanks, thanks so much, Rick. Rick. Yeah. Uh, at this time, I'm going to introduce our speaker, Dr. Sue McLernan. Rick did a great job. Um, she currently serves as the program director for the College of St. Scholastica and, and, like you said, was instrumental in the creation of their new Master's in Healthcare Administration, which launched this past January. So that is really exciting. Um, Dr. McLernan has served in healthcare leadership and administration for 30 years, which includes teaching at the U, serving as COO of St. Mary's here in Duluth and vice president of Bayfront Medical Center in St. Petersburg, Florida. So among others, we're really happy you're here. Um, but as always, we encourage your participation throughout the session. Um, we wanna keep this engaging and conversational. So please pop on to ask questions, use the chat to continue the conversation. Um, we will have additional time at the end for some Q&A and there will be some breakout room conversations. So I'm excited to get going. So Dr. McLernan, thank you so much for joining us, um, sharing your knowledge of healthcare and you're welcome to, to take it away. Thank you, Chris. Thank you and welcome everybody. It's good to see some old friends and meet some new ones. We will do some introductions here. Um, I have to laugh. My husband called me just about an hour ago. He says, you're a thought leader in healthcare now. <laughs> and I laughed. Um, but anyways, let's go ahead with introductions. I like to know who I'm visiting with and working with. Um, so if you wouldn't mind, we're going to go around and ask you to share your name, your current role and organization and any industry niche or anything. And if it's related to healthcare or not, that's just fine. And then why are you interested in innovation? So um, do you guys, if somebody would just jump in, Jose, I don't know. Do you want me to call out or people want to go? Hey, Sue, I'll, I'll lead off. Great, um, thank you. So Roger Reinert, uh, I am the a licensed attorney, owner of Reinert and Associates. We work in um, statewide local government space, also teach adjunct at Scholastica um, in both the Stender as well as um, School of Arts. And just interested because, uh, you know, this is a huge, um, not just a huge public policy conversation, but also healthcare is such a uh, major industry for our Duluth and regional community. Yeah, thank you. Jose? Good morning. I am Jose with the City of Duluth Department of Workforce Development. I'm a career counselor there. Uh, one of the things I get to do is help uh, many of our local community members uh, enter the healthcare field. So I'm interested in innovation to see what's next in that industry. Okay, Michelle. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Michelle Ufford, and I'm the Director of Workforce Strategy and Talent Pipeline Development for Essentia Health. Um, that's a system-wide role, and certainly uh, my interest is in workforce development and how we build up our pipeline into healthcare and certainly understanding how the industry is moving and changing in regard to innovation will help us better articulate what our opportunities exist in the industry because we know that a lot of those young folks are really interested in doing different cutting edge sorts of things. So very interested in, in um, sitting in today. Thank you. Thank you. Amber. RB. Vicki. 
Hi, I'm Vicki Noe. I'm an architect with DSW Architects, and I've just been working on a few healthcare projects lately, so I just thought this might awesome. be interesting to sit in on. Awesome. Jenna? Hi, I'm Jenna Kowaleski. Um, I work at St. Luke's in the marketing department, and I've been here for just over a year, so just trying to continue to learn more about um, the healthcare space. Awesome. Okay. Tariq? Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, Tariq Hussain, I own a company and I build robots in healthcare industry, software robots, as well as physical robots uh, to help uh, the staff, staffing issues that hospitals are facing these days. Okay. So very much into the innovation space. Welcome. Thank you. Stacy. Hi, Stacy Oltman with Northland Constructors, and we've obviously worked for a number of healthcare professionals on their infrastructure. And uh, Sue, I'm just really excited for you in this role. And so uh, I was curious to learn about what you're doing and just and just hear some of the innovations. Awesome. Well, I just um, am excited. And did I miss anybody? I'm sorry. I don't, um, anybody wanna step in that I missed? RB or Vicki, didn't hear from you. But anyways, well, just welcome for being here and thank you. Um, it's exciting for me. Uh, I um, stepped out of operations in um, 07 and named my company Innovative Healthcare Leadership, my consulting company, as I went back, worked on my PhD. Um, I've always had an interest in, in innovation. So it's very exciting to kind of come and talk on this. And yet, um, you know, I, I put in there why uh, some things haven't changed and I... Uh, you know, I'm just recovering from a eye surgery. I, so I apologize for the cancellation, but I had a retinal detachment. Ended up with an infection. So, you know, there's still some of the same things in healthcare that we've got to work through. And so that's kind of why I put the leading tag of, and are they changing? And we'll talk a little bit about that. But I always say, let those things that are frustrating uh, fuel our inspiration from Sonia Boyce here. And um, I'm just excited to be with you today. And hopefully it's gonna be a dialogue and I do have a little bit of uh, interaction. Um, and I'll be, uh, I also love this one. Um, vision means seeing things differently before anyone else. And I, I just um, left my, my mom who is diabetic. And I remember about a year and a half ago, she was having a lot of trouble managing her diabetes. And, and my husband just went out to the Walgreens, came back with a Libre. We'd been talking to her about it for several months and she just wasn't interested, 87. And um, he just went out, bought it. I just put it on her arm and we started using it. Now she can't hardly live without it. Hey, Sue, it's two weeks, need a new Libre. If anybody's seen it, it's just a little button you stick in on an arm. And she's got a little monitor that she just puts on it anytime you can tell her blood sugar. It tells her if it's going high, it tells her if it's going low with alarms. They can upload it to the doctor's office and not. So is that not cool or what? And so I was down at the Mayo Clinic talking to a, a physician who was, was saying, well, be needing to look at that. And I said, well, maybe I'll go get a Libre and start seeing what's going on with my blood sugars. I said, you had anybody do that? And he said, no. I said, well, we need to start thinking that way. So I'm kind of interested in always seeing something that's different. So today, what I want to quickly, you know, cover with you and make sure we have some time for some dialogue at the end is I am going to shamelessly just give you a brief overview of the MHA program at CSS, very brief, but I, I'm doing it in the sense of innovation. Then I really want to focus on healthcare innovation from a, you know, give you a little background, inform. I always like to say connect. How does this all connect? And then how can we transform uh, within healthcare? Share some resources and then we'll have time for Q&A. So I hope that's a good agenda for today. And I just wanted to share that um, when I was asked, it was like kind of a daunting, I actually got to start the bachelor's degree in health services management down at the Twin Cities University of Minnesota in 2014. Within a year, we had it approved by the regents and up and running. Um, I always said, why did that big you know, university not have an undergrad with the need for healthcare administrators and the need for healthcare leaders at all levels? Um, and we grew that program to about 250 students and it's going strong. So those of you in the workforce, um, looking for undergrads, those, it's just wonderful to see. I was the first graduate at the College of St. Scholastic and Health Services Management, kind of navigating my own way through thinking I wanted to be a physician, realizing I loved leadership and business and found this perfect space for me. 
And so I've, I'm always excited when I can turn um, young people or anybody looking for career changes into this part of, you know, the industry is so broad, there's so many needs. So I appreciate all of those you doing the workforce development and I am doing my part, hopefully to train some future leaders for you guys um, in the space of healthcare. And so I think that, um, then, then to get asked to come to Scholastic and start a master's was daunting to think about it. But once I thought, I thought, hey, we can do this differently. A lot of things when they start from scratch can be done differently. So we did. We did kick off our first cohort. We're doing fall and spring. It is online program. So they've had a wonderful rural health and MBA focus. And we're moving those students into this program. But now we can do long-term care, all the different niches of healthcare a little broader with the MHA. It's a 42 credit, two to three year program. And um, we'll have an on-campus capstone graduation experience. Um, anyways, but I wanted to share, I created an industry advisory board. How would I do this? And I, I found that I have to have experts from the industry. So I asked 28 um, executives across the United States, across a variety of healthcare settings to join me in this journey. And they said, yes. And we had our kickoff meeting in September and they helped me create a mission, vision, values for the program in sync with the colleges, um, but specific for the MHA program and have been just my dynamite partners in getting this off the ground. And this is our vision statement to develop dynamic, effective leaders who serve and advance healthcare and the well-being of people, organizations and communities by transforming health services. And I wanted to show that when they helped me create the competencies, because we're saying, what do we need in the future? What, not just the competencies. And I'll, I laugh because we had innovation before the, the accrediting body has just come out in 22 with like innovation as one of the competencies. But we had that through our industry advisory boards um, leadership. So these are the competencies. And I just wanted to point out that innovation is a part of it. And some of the things that we've been able to do just in getting this program, I think are innovative is we've been partnering with Rick's leadership in the Benedict and Leadership Institute. Um, we also partnered with the doctorate and nursing program and their students are now merging with our students in the MHA program through classes and just the dynamite uh, work that that's creating. Um, we've been partnering with the associations. We have, you know, looked at our niches. We have wonderful HIM, health sciences, regional rural health science and long-term care and post-acute. And now I see the future of integrative medicine um, the UMD Med School and Pharmacy School are coming along and there's all kinds of cool innovations that we can continue to do. So this advisory board's just been dynamite for me. And I think another thing from an educational standpoint, but it affects us in the workplace, is understanding that we used to call these soft skills, but now they're called the 21st century skills. And right at the very top, there is learning and innovation skills. Um, so I just, you know, I think we're on the right track here by looking at some innovation. And um, another great book out there by Daniel Pink is A Whole New Mind and really to start getting ourselves thinking about how can we solve these complex challenges that some have been around for a long time. And um, we need both left and right brains and we need these um, skills. And I'll never forget when I went down to the Mayo Center for Innovation years ago and got a tour to, to think that we had architects, they had design anthropologists all working to re kind of tool healthcare down there. So it's kind of fun to see our DSGW friends who build beautiful places in healthcare uh, join us. And that whole integration of many parts and pieces working together will make some innovation happen. So I think that's pretty exciting. So let's get on to the healthcare. Thank you for letting me shamelessly sell the college and uh, the MHA program. Um, so just to inform, I always have to go back, and Roger will appreciate this. He's a historian. Um, we got to go back to history a little bit to um, uh, understand where, where we're coming from in the world of innovation. Um, and we're in a kind of a special place here in Minnesota. So I have a polling question. I'm going to have uh, Chris help me. Where was the first health maintenance organization founded? Chris, can they go onto their screen? There should it should be up now. Okay, I see it there. Can you guys tell me where it was? Where was the first? California, Texas, Minnesota, Massachusetts. Need your vote. Oh, 
Oh, I have to do my vote, I bet, huh? <laughs> <laughs> now, now where do the answers show up? <laughs> I should know. <laughs> should I end this? Are you ready for me to launch them? Are you, everybody in? I think so. All right. We'll see what they. We'll see, we'll see how smart this group is. All right, California. Good guess because you got Kaiser out there. Minnesota, sixty percent. Massachusetts, thirty. Okay. All right. Well, the answer is Minnesota. So, right. um, it and health maintenance organizations were in 1973 founded in, in Minnesota, and they had a bad rap and have had a bad rap. But the whole premise of a HMO was that will for a certain set dollars give you a set of services. And those have now changed over time. And if you've heard of ACOs, um, they have been the kind of come back where you still have some choice and um, ISNs, integrated um, service networks and IPAs, delivery systems with physician groups. Um, so are kind of these same things where we're kind of doing population health a little bit and giving you some, it's kind of an insurance approach. But um, let me go over here, sorry, my cursor here. So anyways, I just from a histori historical standpoint, I always tell my students and a lot of people don't know that Minnesota has been a great innovative learning laboratory. I, I was trained obviously in Minnesota and then I went south to Florida and then I went to Texas, but we were way ahead. When I left Minnesota, I felt like it was five to 10 years ahead in healthcare. Um, understanding kind of where things were and where they might be going. And so it was really didn't realize until you leave that you have this kind of privilege of uh, learning in one of the best healthcare market and systems labs in the nation, Minnesota. Uh, the market's been viewed as one of it, if not the most advanced healthcare markets in the nation for several decades. We're rated third in the U.S. in our healthcare, um, healthcare status. And why is that? How did it happen? I think we've had a pretty progressive social culture. We've had a commitment to access for a lot longer than many quality and a commitment to quality and a commitment to cost as values. So what happened here differently than in many states? We had some early development of large group practices. Those of you Ascension may never have heard the word Duluth Clinic, but that was one of the large group practices. Mayo Clinic, um, down in the Twin Cities, Minnesota Urology, GI, uh, Minji, all kinds of single um, big practices. The physicians have been very engaged in leadership. I uh, mentioned Mayo, Hazelton, Betty Ford. We've been top in the country for many years with chemical dependency over the years. We also had early development of multi-hospital systems and integrated health systems. Um, but we also had a maintenance uh, commitment to nonprofit hospitals. Having worked down in the South where I had over 40, 50% 40, were for-profits, there's a big difference in the industry. Um, we also, out of our kind of universities, had the biotech medical alley here. Um, with the University of Minnesota physicians leading the development in heart, Mentronic, Boston Scientific, St. Jude. And we have a huge, strong nonprofit long-term care system. And again, in the country, 75% of, of long-term care is for-profit, 25% nonprofit. Minnesota, no, uh, nonprofit. Strong rural health system as well. We're also innovative in our quality and safety. The Minnesota Hospital Association has led quality and safety for over 25 years. That's top in the nation. We had formed the Minnesota Alliance of Patient Safety. We will come back around to that, which involved residents, nursing units, hospitals, doctors, medical associations, a very comprehensive group committed to improving patient safety. Strong nursing leadership. We have this Minnesota Community Measurement Project, if you haven't heard of it, where Physician practices, health systems report their data to one place and we can benchmark across certain diagnostic groups and try and improve chronic disease uh, care and, and are willing to share that information in order to improve care. Um, and that led to my research in diabetes and uh, the psychosocial factors of why and how could we improve diabetes. Um, I actually said, um, you know, I wonder how much is the health systems can we control the people doing their things in the, and diabetic, how much is the patient responsibility, which led to kind of my work in that um, space. Uh, collaboration has been a big thing in our state. 
I remember sitting next to Judy Faulkner at Epic Midwest Epic meetings. Essentia, if anybody didn't know, little known fact, had bought the first uh, enterprise package from Epic. Um, and when I came to Duluth, um, they were still in the middle and they didn't, Judy didn't even have all those products that she had sold us uh, developed, but I had fun um, helping work with that. And, and, but all the health systems were working with this coalition. So those are kind of another reason, health policy, thought leaders, and a focus on cost control. As I mentioned, we're the first home of HMO started here. Minnesota Physician Patient Alliance has been a group of independent physicians working to protect that physician patient relationship. We had the MinCare tax in 1992, where we took some dollars and put that to make sure people had access and were insured um, through our Medicare Medicaid system. And um, it was taxing healthcare providers, very controversial. Um, but we were able to keep Minnesota at about 94% of insured. Um, and uh, we have some pricing and transparency efforts. And um, also because we had large employers here way back in the 80s, 70s and 80s, Delta, 3M, um, it was, a, you know, Republic Airlines, I'm old. Um, anyways, we had large employers working on healthcare costs and managing that. So lots of um, innovation going on in this marketplace for a long time. And I, I contend that one of the other key factors here in Minnesota that's different is because of our commitment to excellent education at all levels, but especially at the um, collegiate level, and uh, Scholastic has been a leader. It has the um, oldest standing medical records HIM program in the country, uh, has the only, had the only rural health MBA. It, in its Center for Innovation, actually, I worked on the hospital side from Essentia St. Mary's, where we created some real patient charts that they were able to transfer into a simulation system, uh, EPIC and use it as a training ground. And now they sold that product to other colleges and um, universities across the country so that we can actually train students with real patient outcomes on strokes, births, all that type of thing, all the uh, people in, in health science students. So really cool products that come out of here. Our research centers are bar none are, are sought across the country by CMS. Um, medical management was really founded at the University of Minnesota Duluth School of Pharmacy, and that's where pharmacists now actually can get paid by Medicare to do pharmacy and medication management with physicians and look at all of that stuff. So really um, innovative, excellent health sciences educational institution. So, um, so next, let's talk a little bit about now. Um, where are we in healthcare innovation? Any questions so far? And here's my quote. One tech savvy physician recently put it, we're practicing medicine with the most sophisticated technology in history, but we're still keeping safety on sticky notes. Um, and I have to laugh. I have, you know, had to go in the ER and some healthcare settings recently. And I do have to laugh. There's some of the same old things from 20 years ago when I was there. <laughs> so we do have some opportunity still. Um, you know, and I think about how are we scheduling? I think of how my son at a, an adult foster care, you know, they're instantly on their phones picking up shifts and how, how some of these smaller businesses are doing things. You know, I just talked to a, um, a physician practice who deals with hospitals saying the accuracy of their registration data is still very bad and they have to redo it with patients. So I think we still have opportunities uh, within it. So there are some things that have not really changed and there's some things that have really changed. So uh, we're going to have to think about that in the world of innovation. Um, but, you know, where does innovation happen? Does it happen in our organizations? Does it happen in our associations? Who's, who's leading it? Is it through collaborations? Um, obviously, I always say form follows function. Is that an architectural term too? Um, but I also say structure matters. Um, where and how do we set up our systems to foster innovation? Is it built into our organizations? Is it a part of our daily life? So just some um, of my thoughts on who are leaders in healthcare innovation, who I've been tracking over the last 20 years. Um, I, I was down in Barbados speaking at a conference and IBM was there um, speaking and this was 2017 and they had just built the first total digital hospital up in Canada in a partnership, um, Hamilton Health Services. And you know, to uh, 2022 is when they implemented an EMR. 
So it was interesting to talk about digital, um, but it wasn't quite all digital. Um, obviously, I had some colleagues that I knew uh, that started the Mayo Clinic Center for Innovation. So I got special um, some tours down there and kept in touch with them. Their work with IDO um, in creating their center, and actually that center went away and um, is now integrated into day-to-day -day practice uh, with a Mayo Clinic Center for Exchange, uh, Innovative Exchange. Uh, the Cleveland Clinic has some fantastic medical. Um, a little bit more on the medicine side of um, innovation. Uh, Boston Scientific, I uh, work with them. They have uh, providers where they're doing expert mapping. So if they're training technology, uh, for example, their uh, heart device was being inserted with a high uh, complication rate. So they got a bunch, their five top experts across the world together and built a map of exactly what these experts that are so good do. And from there, they could back that into design and training and they reduce the complications significantly on their um, trial and were able to get FDA approval on a very innovative device um, to put in the heart. Um, another, so there's a great book out if you want a resource that I, I know Dr. Uh, LaRusso was one of the founders of the center at, and Barb Spurrier and obviously the CEO of um, Mayo Now, Think Big, Start Small, Move Fast, a blueprint for transportation. They did some really cool things where they brought in a group of design people, looked at a clinic room, started working on redesigning uh, clinic spaces. Um, and their work is is out there and is is excellent. And you can feel and touch that if you ever do go down to the mail. Now it's turned into the innovation exchange, which is kind of cool because they're funding ventures. And so um, people can apply uh, to work with them uh, through their exchange on scientific improvements. And obviously it went back to the founder, William Mayo. Um, so they right now in their current center the way they approach it is expertise and advice from their scientists. They have maker space, which um, and sim centers and research studies, clinical trials, um, and then they have these funding centers. So I don't know if people knew that, and I think that's really kind of important to know. You can see who they're partnering with, which I think is also always important. Um, Optum, you know, we're the home of United Healthcare, and uh, they just told me that they they have the uh, largest number of employed physicians in the country under um, them. And Optum, I've been to their center for applied innovation. It's worth a, a tour. And I take my students there. And it's really um, high-packed innovation gender. It's quite, quite interesting, especially during COVID. Uh, it was a very interesting center where the amount of data and information that they can have across the country was amazing. The VA, not a lot of people think about the Veterans Administration as a uh, center for operations, um, but the VA has done a ton of work on innovation. And so you'll start seeing different ways of, of discover, test, replicate, scale. IDO has provided one, uh, Mayo has one in their book about different methodologies on innovation. So I think um, at this point, it'd be good to get everybody just a little bit involved, but those are just a few examples of some of the, the work that's being done. There's multiple centers for innovation in healthcare, um, both in healthcare organizations and industry. So I'm gonna ask if you guys would please bear with me and go into um, a little brief breakout group. I wanna hear back from you. Um, and the question is, what is the current innovation for your company is using? And what is an innovation from outside healthcare that we could bring into healthcare? And just to kind of spark a thought, uh, I don't know if you know, but Walmart had started the concept where they, they have vendors who bring them goods into the store, but they don't pay the vendor until the product leaves the store. So they weren't paying the inventory costs. Well, healthcare figured that out when we had these high pacemaker, let's say an $80,000 pacemaker from Medtronic sitting on our shelves, we got smart and brought that idea into healthcare where Medtronic didn't get paid by us on the healthcare side until it was implanted in a patient and reduced our inventory costs. So to me, that's kind of an innovation idea 
example from outside healthcare that we could bring into healthcare. So um, again, Chris is gonna help me. And I see there's a chat. Do I need to answer anything in the chat? Are we good? I'm sorry, I can only join till nope. 11.30. That's <laughs> We're all fine. Set. I'm gonna go ahead and launch those breakout rooms. One and more. by the way, she's recording. So I'm sure you can get access to the recording. But if you guys would just take a few minutes, um, if how many are you gonna put in a group, Chris? You wanna do three? We'll have um, three or four. Okay, three or four, then we'll do uh, four minutes. Perfect, one moment. Welcome back. How many groups did we have, Chris? Two or three? Two. Okay. Did somebody report from group one? Uh, yeah, I will go. Um, none of us were in healthcare, so we focused on the first question, a uh, current innovation our company is using. Perfect. Um, what we came up with was uh, digital documents using technologies such as DocuSign or Adobe Sign to process forms and paperwork. Awesome. Uh, we also talked about communicating with people via text compared to other forms of communication. Mm -hmm. Hasn't that changed life? <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Okay. Any any one of those you think we need to bring into healthcare? All of them? All of the above. Yeah. Well, we've been doing some of this too. Okay. Uh, group two. Christy, will you take off your mute? I can see you're you're gonna help us, but you're on mute. Sorry about that. I have a dog and I just don't want the dog to bark. Oh, it's thank okay. you. So for innovation, so um, my husband and I own Vita Pizza and we just did, our second location opened and we put in a drive up window. So that was an innovation. Awesome. I don't think anyone in the Northland has drive up pizza. So that I was- that, I love it. Yes. <laughs> And Sue, I actually worked with you back at Essentia, but that's a side note. Um, okay. And then Tariq has a great idea. He could expand on it, but he works in robotics. And his robotics are already doing, um, helping with the record process and helping with release of information. Awesome. And his physical robots that are in the rooms helping with nursing. Awesome. Are they the ones that deliver the meals? Uh, that is correct. So meal is... One of the things that they work on, yeah. Are you doing the ones in Essentia? Uh, no, no, no. Oh, no. okay. I heard they're coming in the yeah. new hospital, so and they may be there already. Yeah. Who's who's my Essentia friends? Did you? Is it there in the hospital yet? The robotics that's delivering the food and supplies that is coming. So awesome. Yeah. Well, those are great, and I think I think my point there is that obviously there are things like, you know, drive up windows that we actually need in healthcare too, right? Where's the, the walk up uh, for the nurse at night who just needs to pull something out, right? And, you know, they have definitely done some of that. But I think that other industries interact with healthcare in such an important way that if we sometimes get stuck, and I, I often found that I had to really go outside and start, and I'd go, oh, we could do that, you know? And so the more we can think about things we see that we like, um, bring that into innovation is really important. So let's cover, you know, just, I think it's important to hear some of the innovations that are happening right here in our region, um, but in the world, I kind of categorized it by technology and medical. Um, so uh, Tariq, you can help me here, but I remember us again, how old I am uh, when we mm -hmm. bought the first robotics into the OR at Essentia, um, which is now called US Surgical. And uh, you know what, I'll be honest, it, it took a three hour procedure, became 12 hours, the first ones uh, as, and two teams of doctors and all kinds of things. And we had to fight with the insurance companies. And um, it's really quite, you know, bringing innovation in is, is not always easy, right? Um, and there's now tons of robotic use, even at Accenture, or many of our health systems that have expanded greatly beyond just in the OR. Um, I just, uh, lungs, PET scanners, all kinds of things. How about artificial? Do you want to say anything, Tariq, on robotics? I mean, they're delivering food, they're delivering supplies, they're they're doing a lot of things. And with workforce shortages, right? It's a critical issue, opportunity. So thank you. And I, I think the fun one as educators, we're of course watching chat GPT. Um, how many of you have tried it? I don't know, I can't see your hands, but I, I would assume a few of you have gone up. Um, artificial intelligence is here 
And uh, there, thank you, Tariq. Um, I tried it too for my new syllabus. I thought this is going to be fun, but we're obviously concerned because it's going to impact learning. You know, if people can just go in and do this, how are doctors using it? How are, you know, how is it going to be? Is it going to be telling us the right things, especially in medical where we can kill someone? Um, you know, we take it pretty seriously. So, um, but it is, uh, there's a cool um, YouTube I included in the slides, um, chat, chat GPT with the University of uh, California um, San Francisco physicians and executives were talking about different ways they're going to use it for medical education and then also, um, you know, in medical care. Uh, there's a new system out called DAX, Dragon Ambient Experience, which is really, you know, we went to the EMR and then all of a sudden we had to bring in scribes and pay another person to be in there where supposedly the EMR was going to help us reduce costs of staffing. So this is a nuance who has been bought by Microsoft, um, a, a new way for dictation um, that they're innovating. Uh, other ones are asset tracking solutions. In, in healthcare, we have a lot of different machines and equipment. And um, so there's, there's new um, innovative technologies in that. The electronic medical records were supposed to be the big innovation. And like I told you, I'm way back to uh, long ago in that work. Um, and, uh, you know, it was, I, I had to tell them it was kind of a model Model T car when it came into healthcare and it's still being obviously tweaked. Um, but my chart, how amazing to be able to go on to our phone now, see upcoming appointment reminders, see our medical charts. I was able to share it with my ophthalmologist, you know, my surgical notes and because they hadn't gotten to them yet. So, uh, you know, obviously there is some amazing innovation there. There's some um, hospital acquired infections, uh, pressure ulcer, patient monitoring systems like showing a 70% reduction in all, um, ulcers and in infections in a hospital acquired telehealth systems. Well, COVID kind of pushed that, you know, thankfully the payment system changed during COVID and now we're going to battle back. But we know that telehealth has been a lifeline for many people. Uh, elderly, mental health, um, people are preferring that system as much as they can. So we don't, we've seen huge change in that. There's another thing called the ParoGuard, which sounds alarms for the doctors in the laparoscopic surgery if they are hitting anywhere they shouldn't. 3D printing, we'll be seeing limbs coming off of 3D printers, I think, soon. Lots of stuff. Innovation in medical treatments, kind of switching gears to more of the medical side, precision medicine, genetics. Postpartum depression has been a huge issue. They think it's twice um, under, you know, over 50% unrecognized. We've had a huge increase in maternal um, mortality, which has gone the wrong way the last 10 years. Depression may be a part of that. And this is an infusion treatment. Uh, cancer treatments have been changing just dra drastically. This PMSA for prostate cancer, now they can actually trace through a PET scanner. Uh, novel diabetic drugs are out there um, on the weight loss and uh, other things like that that are coming. Reduction in the LDL drug has seen huge improvements for heart disease, implantable for uh, device for severe paralysis. They're finding huge, there's like 5 million people with paralysis. So, you know, obviously one of our biggest costs in the healthcare system is chronic disease. I mean, it's 60% of our costs in the health system. If we can get our core chronic diseases under control, um, our health will improve dramatically. So that to me always should be a focus area in innovation. I just uh, was with a, a company called Wound Sync, um, Wound Evolution out of the Southeastern part of the United States. It's a physician there. And if anybody didn't know, there's not even a training program for wound care. It's not a residency yet, but look at this. One in three Americans are pre-diabetic. You know the facts. And uh, this company has now over um, 20 hospital-based wound care clinics using hyperbaric and evidence-based practices, as well as their independent practices throughout the Southeast. And they're just, um, going gangbusters with, with health in there. The government is, is working in innovative spaces, CMS and NIH, the VA health system I mentored, they have a Shark Tank Live, some that rapid Naxalone initiative came from the VA system, if you didn't know that. Uh, federally qualified health centers, 
Um, why? Because they've always worked with the social determinants of health, which is coming in a minute, to provide excellent quality outcomes. So really cool. Um, and obviously a lot of work on value-based. So my two theories are that we need to connect and the more you connect, the more innovation is going to happen. So these partnerships that you'll see in healthcare that are really producing the innovation is coming out of places like UCSF and Microsoft with AI, IBM and Hamilton Health, Medical Alley here in the Minnesota, um, Superior Health, which is a cool innovation that came out of the Minnesota Hospital Station Association. Just some slides here to show that all these hospital associations, quality improvement organizations and end-stage renal kidney are working together on quality improvement across these um, states. And my friend Tanya Daniels is leading that effort and they're all about innovation. Um, and finally, to transform, what, what is the future innovation in healthcare? I believe the thing that's been missing is this collaboration and this connection in healthcare between these social determinants of health that we have to understand that it it's, uh, varies, but in most studies show between 16 and 32% of health is impacted by the healthcare system. Kind of a big slap in the face for those of us who've worked our heart out in healthcare, going, what, what? How are we not making more of a difference? Well, it's environment. Uh, it's social determinants of health. And I'm gonna share a case study very briefly in ProMedica and you can look them up, but they won the Healthcare Innovations first place winner this year. But what if you just a brief social determinants of health um, is really showing that where we are born, live, work, all affects our health. And um, we're focused on, you know, this healthcare right here is, is about, you know, 16 to 25%, but access to education, whoops, um, economic stability, social housing, and the neighborhoods and how we're built. So people like DSGW have a huge impact, almost as much as us on um, healthcare and health. So why do I think the key for innovation in the future is the social determinants being blended with our healthcare systems? I, I believe it strongly. So this ProMedica in Toledo, Ohio is a huge, like an essential size health system, 28 counties screening patients um, with the social determinant help. They worked with Epic and created a tool that's now available to all where we can start screening patients on 10 outcomes. Uh, evidence-based, develop connections with community-based organizations. They started working with like Essentia and St. Luke's has worked with me in my maternity home for homeless pregnant women, where we're starting to say we can reduce um, and produce better outcomes with term babies by helping these moms who are homeless. And so those kind of community-based nonprofits working with CHUM um, really make a difference. And then there's a holistic approach and we talk about pop health, that's where it's gotta happen. They showed that uh, their food clinic where they just worked on the food issue with their patients, 33% uh, decrease in ER visits, 14% decrease in inpatient visits, 6% in primary care. Their healthcare cost savings were 6,500 to 17,000 per patient in their system as they track this over the last three years. And they're also in a collaboration now with AARP to form the Root Cause uh, Coalition. So another thing, I, I call it the sleeper in healthcare. Um, functional and integrative medicine is here and it's coming big. Uh, there's a new book out by Tony Robbins. I'm listening to it right now. It's pretty amazing, interesting. He just left um, the Vatican where they had national, international scientists from Stanford, John Hopkins, all across the world sharing what's going on with new testing, with um, integrative and functional medicine. So maybe a book you want to look at. Uh, they're talking about stem cell therapy, uh, regeneration without surgery, all kinds of new things. So I would inc encourage you to do that. Uh, words of caution, we just did in my class a, a case study on the Theranos case. If you've not heard of Theranos, was a, a, a woman, Elizabeth, who uh, convinced the world, including Walgreens, that she had the test that would just take a little bit of blop of blood and be able to give you all the tests instead of the tubes that we take now. And of course, that has she is now going to jail. Um, so be wary. Do the hard work, select your partners wisely. Those are my words of wisdom or caution and words of wisdom, develop expertise and the love of learning because things are gonna change every day. Uh, do our research and homework, look outside the industry, collaborate widely, find and apply innovations one by one they add up. So 
on this uh, slide, it was just, if you want something new, you have to stop doing something old. Peter Drucker, one of my favorites. So I am done. I've shared some resources with you and I want to open it up to questions. Thank you so much for having me today. Are we okay? Yep, got nine minutes, a little bit over. We do have some time for questions. So if you want to pop on audio video, you're welcome to. Otherwise, post it in the chat and we can read it for you. Or insights you want to share. Insights you want to share. I can start with a question. I have a question. Sure. A lot of these innovations that you're talking about um, would require, would have quite significant barriers to implementation. So how how do you recommend or how are some ways that these larger healthcare organizations can kind of overcome those barriers to change, like time, funding, kind of internal buy-in? Because a lot of that can be um, placed or at least, you know, tips can be utilized in any industry, mm -hmm. right? And just on a different scale. So how do you see those barriers being overcome? Sure. I think two things. I think you start small and you do kind of a pilot area. And we've done this a lot of times where we'll just take a certain area, test it, make sure it's going to work and it's scalable. And then I think the more that you get the people who are doing the work involved in that design and in that change, and you get those champions, the natural champions, then from a, a scalability standpoint, it kind of rolls out way better. So I remember when I did order entry system in 1982 at St. Mary's, the first time we could connect on a computer between PT and all those, and we had to get everybody involved. I had teams everywhere, and it really made the implementation go so much smoother. Perfect. Thank you. Good question. Anyone else have questions? Christy says, thank you. She loves your enthusiasm for healthcare. Oh, Happy to see you, you, Christy. And I love your Vita pizza. <laughs> and the new drive up. <laughs> yes, I'm going to go try it. <laughs> it's the best. As someone who lives close by, I'm just telling you, this is a game changer. Yeah, that's right. So one right. thing, I'm yeah, go, go ahead. Is, I mean, a lot of different elements um, that need to come together for for real innovation. Just example of we we're talking about the robots, right? If the doors in the hospital are not um, wary of, like, if somebody is trying to enter the door, I mean, robots, I mean, need to have the ability to open the door using a lock code or something. So, I mean, the bot is just sitting outside and not able to get in the room. Just simple example, right? Yeah, yeah. Similarly, I'm seeing like so many different scenarios where due to all these different elements not coming together, innovation just stops there. Yeah, yeah. It's so complex, right? Because you don't know that you have to have security involved, <laughs> yeah. you know, yeah. or always think through all. And, you know, having been in healthcare administration, I just have have such an appreciation, I guess, for the complexity. Um, and you need that with the innovators from the outside coming in, because I've worked with a lot of technology companies trying to work with healthcare, and they find it very hard because we are that complex and it's all those little details. Um, so it's nice to hear you say, or, you know, it's important to hear you say that it does take all those people to be involved. I mean, marketing is here. You know, it's that communication with patients. I mean, there's just so much um, when you're doing what you think is kind of a supply chain project, but it's really, it's a complex project co covering the whole health system. And it will stop it dead if you don't do it right. True. But, but there is hope, you know, I, I do see some things and we got to, you know, keep on looking on those little things that, that aren't working well in healthcare and really try to use these innovations to tackle those things. The workforce is going to continue to be our biggest challenge right now. And so I appreciate you guys thinking, how are we going to train people? And then how are we going to use technology and equipment like robots to help us deliver the services we need to 24-7 oftentimes? So. Yeah. 
Wonderful. Thank you. Oh, you guys, thank you for your time today. I appreciate you having me. Thank you so much, Dr. McLernan. Thank you for spending your afternoon with us. Um, we appreciate the College of St. Scholastica at Stender School for their sponsorship, of course, of this series. And Dr. McLernan, if you want to stay on just for an extra minute, see if anyone has any questions, but otherwise yeah. you are and all you free to go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, perfect. Well, thank you so much and have a great afternoon.